So welcome um, to the presentation on Inside the BBC by Colin Philpott. Um, YPS members may remember that Colin gave us a wonderful presentation earlier this year on all those World War II hidden buildings. And I bought a copy of the book and I really enjoyed reading that. Um, Colin was at one point um, head of BBC Yorkshire and he helped to revamp Look North. And he's got a lot of things to tell us about his time, both in front of the camera and behind the camera as a presenter and a producer. So welcome, Colin. Thank you very much. Um, and it's nice to be back, um, having the opportunity to speak with the Yorkshire Philosophical Society. Um, there is a connection actually between the secret wartime Britain that I talked about earlier in the year and the BBC. And I can't remember whether I mentioned this previously, that of course the BBC itself had lots of, at the time, secret locations during the Second World War, um, mainly to uh, the places that it could broadcast from that were well away from London, so that it had Broadcasting House being um, attacked and bombed during the war. It was bombed, but it wasn't put out of action, so many of these places um, never came into use. But that's another story for another day. Um, so it's great, it's great to be back with you. And I think we couldn't really have timed this better, could we, in the sense that I mean, two reasons. One, um, as you will observe, um, there's quite a bit of discussion going on at the moment about the future of the BBC, you know, the funding of the BBC. Indeed, some would say about the, the very existence of the BBC, you know, partly um, provoked by comments that have been made by um, members of the government. So there's a, there's a discussion about, you know, what do we want from the BBC? And even some people might say, do we want the BBC at all? So there's that going on. Uh, but of course, also, it's the centenary. Uh, I think it was about two weeks ago, I think it was the 18th uh, of, or 17th or the 18th, I think, of October was the um, 100th birthday of what originally was the British Broadcasting Company. And I think the actual 100 years since the first radio broadcast is next week or something. It, anyway, it's, it's the centenary time now. Um, I think it's right to say that the BBC is one of the best known British um, brands in the world. Wherever you go, um, people know about the BBC. Um, within the UK, um, everyone has a view about it. Some people love it, some people hate it, some people may be now a bit indifferent to it, but it definitely impacts on all our lives. I think the most recent survey I saw said that 90% of British adults make use of some BBC service or other every week. So, you know, it's important thing that impacts on our, on our lives. Um, I was lucky enough, I, I, I do consider it lucky, to have worked for the BBC for about a quarter of it, its existence. Um, and for a, a large part of my professional life, I worked for BBC for about 25 years. And I'll explain my CV sort of as we go along. Um, now, the BBC is not perfect. Um, it has flaws. It, it has made mistakes, including some pretty serious ones. That have been well publicized but my overall view is that it is an asset which we would lose at our peril and i'll explain why i think that uh, later talking of mistakes um the first place i worked uh Incredible. in the bbc um was uh Get up. Get oh, I'm, started. Hearing, I'm hearing some other sound um Last uh, words. Uh, i'll carry on i'm we assuming everybody can still hear me can you make sure that microphone's on? Okay, I'll carry on. Um, yeah, the first place I worked in the BBC back in the late 1970s was what was then known as BBC Radio Brighton on the South Coast. Um, and, um, you know, the, the BBC makes thousands of editorial decisions every day and lots of other types of decisions. So it's not surprising that there are mistakes. Uh, and I remember one that was an early mistake I became aware of. The, the then manager of BBC Radio Brighton back in the late 70s decided that it would be a jolly good idea if we adopted the 24-hour clock on air. You know, this, this is, we'll all be using the 24-hour clock in a few years' time. And we're going to do this. We're going to be trendsetters at BBC Radio Brighton. So, you know, when you were reading the news, you had to remember, instead of saying BBC Radio Brighton News at 5 o'clock, you had to say BBC Radio Brighton News at 17 hours. And of course, it was a disaster right from the start. People got it wrong all the time. And the, the, I think it's fair to say, mainly older and more traditional listeners of BBC Radio Brighton didn't like it at all and rang 
and they couldn't email in those days. They rang in and they wrote in their address to say, this is silly. And there was a staff meeting at which the staff said to the manager at the time, um, come on, Bob, this, this is really isn't working. You know, let's just drop it. And he, no, 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 it's, it's the way of the future. We need we're going to carry on. So we carried on. And a few days later, I happened to the, the, the manifest sort of stupidity of this policy was rather brilliantly um, shown. I was reading a sort of what's on diary item about things going on in the area, uh, which included an item which went something like this. It was um, at 15 hours this afternoon uh, at the Delaware Pavilion in Eastbourne, there'll be a concert of songs from the shows entitled Music at Three. Um, <laughs> Uh, which rather showed up the stupidity of this thing. And uh, the policy, uh, I'm pleased to say, was dropped um, not long thereafter. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do over the next 40 minutes or so is, is to give you a bit of a flavour of what it was like to work for the BBC, um, which is often, I think, perceived as being rather exciting and glamorous. I mean, it was exciting in many ways, and it was definitely a thing I'm glad I did, but often it's not quite as glamorous as people think. Uh, and what I also want to do is offer a personal view on you know, why I think the BBC is something that we should value. Uh, and actually, I think it's probably more vital to our society now than it was when I first worked for it, um, arguably. Um, a little bit about my CV. You might not recognise this guy, but this is, in fact, me uh, back in um, 1982. And it was another anniversary. It, this was on the um, 60th anniversary, it must have been, of the BBC in 1982. And I was working for the BBC in Newcastle. And as part of the sort of 60th anniversary celebrations, we decided to recreate the first broadcast that had been made by obviously what was then a radio station in Newcastle, the BBC radio station in Newcastle in 1922, which was a classical music concert that was done in the street. So this is in Grey Street, I think, in the middle of Newcastle. And I had to um, uh, masquerade as a violinist. I can't play the violin at all. But um, so that, that, that was um, back in 1982. And just briefly, I joined, I worked for the BBC in various freelance capacities, including at Radio Brighton, as I mentioned. And then I was a, was a graduate trainee with the BBC, graduate news trainee, joined in 1980. And I worked in London for a while, various other places sort of on secondment. And then in Newcastle, where I worked on, on um, as a journalist on Look North from Newcastle. Uh, and then I went to Manchester and I worked there as an on-screen reporter on the local news, but and then I also worked as a reporter based in Manchester for things like Breakfast News and Newsnight. And then I decided, as a lot of people do after a while, that you know, being in front of the camera and the microphone is fine, but actually the sort of real power and decision-making in the organisation is behind the camera. And you know, I wanted to go in that direction, so I became a producer. And I worked on, people might remember, um, a, a programme called Brass Tax, which was a, a really um, uh, good uh, current affairs documentary program on BBC Two for many years. Um, I worked on that. I worked on File on Four, which is still going. Um, it claims, I think, to be the longest running current affairs program on radio anywhere in the world. Um, and I worked on one or two other things. Um, and then I got involved in working on political programs. When the televising of Parliament started, I was involved in the beginnings of that. Uh, and then I worked as a news producer for a while, I was in Manchester. Um, and then I became editor of um, the BBC's local radio station in Manchester and then head of the BBC in the North West. And then I moved over to Leeds um, and was head of the BBC Yorkshire, as you mentioned earlier, uh, for about eight years from 1997 to 2004, I think it was. So uh, briefly, and I left, I, by the way, I left, I resigned from the BBC on the same day as Greg Dyke, but for rather different reasons. He resigned, as you may remember, resigned is a slight euphemism, actually. I think he was sacked, basically, uh, to do with the Hutton report and the whole uh, stuff to do with um, Iraq and weapons of mass destruction. I, I, I uh, resigned for a much more prosaic reason. I've been offered another job uh, and I became director of the National uh, Science and Media Museum, as it now is in Bradford. Um, so... Um, and I do stress that when I'm speaking today, I'm speaking in a personal capacity. I'm not a spokesperson for the BBC. Uh, I'm very happy to at the end, answer any questions you may have, but I, okay, what I ex will express in response to any questions is a personal, um, a personal view. Um, and my experience is, is in the BBC is, is, is really entirely a news, current affairs, documentary, factual programme. So much of what I'm going to talk about is 
to do with that. Uh, one of the first places I worked in, BBC, in the BBC was in Belfast during the Troubles. This was in the early 1980s. It was the time of the hunger strikes uh, that I was there. Um, and I think a really important point about the experience that that gave me working for the BBC in Belfast in the early 80s was that, you know, at that time in Belfast, news was absolutely literally a matter of life and death for everybody. You know, a lot of the time, I suppose we'll all watch the news or listen to the news and, you know, we're interested, but it's sort of happening over there. It doesn't directly impinge on us. I mean, in the last two or three years, it has impinged on us all personally, I suppose, you know, with COVID, et cetera, and, and perhaps in a more in a more impactful way. But a lot of the time, it's sort of a bit out there and we're interested, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily affect us directly. But if you lived in Northern Ireland through the troubles, you know, that clearly wasn't the case. People were hanging on the next news bulletin to find out what was happening most of it usually not good um and the, the the key thing i think i realized when i worked there was actually in the end it's all about trust if you're a news provider it's all about trust do people trust what you're telling them whether a newspaper or a radio station tv news program and, the, and actually the interesting thing i think about the bbc in belfast then and i think it's still true now is that the bbc despite the fact it had the word british in its title uh, and therefore might be perceived to be in somehow associated with, you know, one point of view and one tradition in Northern Ireland, um, wasn't seen like that. Um, it wasn't seen as a mouthpiece of the government or the unionist majority at that time in Northern Ireland. It was seen as being impartial. Um, and it did overall, of course, there were exceptions to this where it got criticised from both sides, but overall it did earn the respect of both communities. And that's a pretty difficult thing to do in circumstances uh, like that. Um, I had my own life and death moment when I worked at the BBC in Belfast. The BBC building in Belfast is on a sort of triangular site and there's the main building and at the sort of apex of the triangle is another building which is a sort of storeroom I think but it's also the, the building that has the BBC bar in it and to be honest when I worked there it wasn't really safe for particularly somebody with an English accent to go wandering around the pubs in Belfast so you tended to go if you wanted to have a drink to the BBC bar with colleagues and there was one particular occasion I went there I confess I think I'd had too much to drink and ended up going to the loo and I probably wasn't feeling that well when I came out of the loo basically the bar had shut and the thing was sort of in darkness and I'd been left locked in there and um, I started rattling the doors it was on the first floor of the bar the next thing I know, there's alarms going off and there are three armed RUC officers pointing their guns up some steps at me because quite often, not often, but on a number of occasions during the Troubles, the, they, the um, paramilitaries on both sides did break into the BBC. Not to they were trying to do anything. They were, I think they did it as a sort of to show that they could. <laughs> um, and obviously it was, you know, it was a building that was very um, much secured. I, so I've got these guys pointing out, I, said, All right, I work for the BBC, I've got my, I was waving my staff ID badge and fortunately they believed me it was a bit of a scary um, a scary experience um, I've been involved in covering quite a few major fairly major and, and sometimes quite difficult news stories you might not remember this this was a train crash in September 1986 on the west coast main line this was a train traveling from London to Manchester which collided head-on with a train coming the other direction from Liverpool to London at the point where the Liverpool and Manchester lines join in Staffordshire. There were about a thousand people on these two trains. It was a, it was a Friday evening rush hour, head-on collision. Ultimately, the cause was found to be a sort of misunderstanding of a new signaling system at the junction. Uh, the driver of one train was killed and about 70 people were injured. Uh, and I was on one of the trains. I was on the train traveling from London to Manchester. Ironically, I'd been at a, 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 an interview for another different job in the BBC that day in London. I didn't get the job actually, um, but I, 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 um, I was on the train. I was in about three carriages from the front and it came to sort of shuddering halt and the carriage I was in came off the rails, but it didn't go right over. It sort of ended at, at a weird angle. And I, I wasn't particularly, I mean, I was thrown across the carriage, but I wasn't really hurt. Neither were other particularly other, other people in the carriage I was in, but one's natural instinct, of course, is to get out. So you, you sort of get to you know, and jump down. And immediately you can see there are lots of people who clearly are injured, who have also been got out who are on the um, track side. Uh, but there seemed to be uh, an astonishing number of people who knew what they were doing in terms of, you know, providing some first aid. Uh, and you could hear sirens because there are obviously ambulances on the way. And a number of us decided that 
contribution we could make was to rip down a fence between where we were and the next and the road, which will make it easier. So we did that and then you know, ambulances arrived. And then I thought, well, actually, you know, what's my role here? And actually, I'm a reporter. So I rang, and this was pre-mobile phones. Uh, I rang um, the newsroom in Manchester, which is where I'm based, and said, you know, to be in a train crash. And one of the things I remember from my journalist training is if you're reporting a, um, you know, something like this, what you need to do as soon as possible is to reduce the area of anxiety for the people who are the audience. If you say two trains have crashed on the West Coast main line, Ooh, anybody who thinks they might have a relative or a friend on the train anywhere between London and Manchester or wherever. No. So I did, obviously I knew what train I was on and I asked somebody what the other train was. So I was able to say, and the first thing I did, you know, it involved two trains. One was a such and such a train from London. Um, and then I ended up, um, you know, staying there and the camera crew was sent. And, and this was before sort of the ability to broadcast live from somewhere quickly. And as I say, before mobile phones, and I ended up doing a piece, a live piece over the phone into the, what was then the main BBC nine o'clock news um, from somebody's front room. I knocked on somebody's door and basically said, you know, can I use your phone because I'm working for the BBC? And they were sat in the back room watching the BBC news and I was broadcasting from their front room. I, I think even to this day, they probably haven't quite got over what was happening. Uh, I ended up staying there for a couple of days and, and reporting on it. So it was a, it was a strange sort of um, experience. Um, a couple of other things you probably will remember that I was involved in as a reporter. The, you know, the first one you might not remember, the Abbeystead disaster was in 1984. This was when a water pumping station blew up in Lancashire uh, and about 28 people, I think, died and 40 people were injured. Some of them really seriously burned. And I mean, it, it was awful. It was a it was a PR visit um, organised by the water authority, as it was in those days. Um, to demonstrate what they were doing to try and stop flooding on the filed coast. And they'd taken people into this water, recently built water station. And what nobody knew was that there'd been a buildup of methane. And I think somebody lit a cigarette on this trip and the whole thing just blew up. Um, it, it resulted in a long running civil case, which I also reported on, you know, about who was liable for this. But um, the thing I particularly remember about that was, I mean, not so much going to the scene, which I did, but actually then going to the Royal Lancaster Hospital, which is where all the injured people were taking and having that experience of, you know, going there as a reporter and but coming face to face with distraught relatives of people who've come to the hospital to find out what's happened to their relative, knowing that they've been taken there. Um, and actually, I got to know quite a few of the people who'd been badly injured in it and the relatives of the people who died in it, because I carried on covering the story afterwards about, you know, the, the legal case, etc., and I think I think the important point about that is that I think journalists quite understandably sometimes are being a, a portrayed as being rather half-hearted. All they're interested in is the story, and you know they'll trample over anybody and anything to get the story. And you know all journalists, most journalists have had the experience of having to go and knock on doors and ask people who've been through awful things if they want to talk or provide a photograph of their child who's just been killed in an accident or something. And you know I have done stuff like that, but I think. What or you know, responsible news organisations like the BBC and many others are mindful of the fact that they have responsibilities to the people whose stories they're covering, and you know there are there are boundaries uh, about how you behave in this situation. You know, that sometimes those boundaries are crossed and rules are broken, and journalists behave inappropriately, as we, as we know. But uh, I think it's important to understand the BBC. If I got it somewhere, the BBC has a book of editorial guidelines that thick you know, about all sorts of things, but including, you know, how you can behave and what you can do and what's acceptable. Some of which is governed by the law of the land, but much more of it's just governed by good custom and practice. Um, another thing I was involved in was the search in the mid 1980s um, of the Moor, of the Saddleworth Moor, when the police decided to go back and try and find further victims of the Moor's murderers. Um, and, and as you may remember, they took a Brady and Hindley back there. I mean, they did identify um, a couple of uh, graves, um, one grave. In fact, there's been a recent search, hasn't there, in the last few weeks when somebody claimed that they found human remains there. I mean, that was a most bizarre um, story to cover where there's all sorts of wild speculation. And I suppose the lesson I draw from that is that, you know, when you're a journalist, in the end, your fundamental duty is to the truth or, or your best attempt to get at the truth rather than speculation or, and all sorts of other things. Um, and a couple of things I was involved in, in, not as a reporter, but as a producer and an editor, a bit later in my career, was the IRA bomb in Manchester in June 1996. Um, and um, 
the thing about that, I was then um, the uh, sort of editor in chief of the BBC in the Northwest, and it was on a Saturday, if you may remember. And in fact, I was bizarrely, um, uh, perfectly normally, but bizarrely, as this was happening, in, in, it was in Bolton near where I lived. Um, uh, clothes shopping and I get, get a call saying uh Colin needs to come and I just managed to get into Manchester BBC before the police sort of cordoned off the whole area and then I was essentially in charge of the operation and, and one of the things that that really taught me was that often with stories like that you you don't really know what's happening you'll have had tidbits of information you know you know something you know there's been an explosion but you've no idea whether people there's people in fact I, I think I'm right saying nobody actually died in that I think one or two people may have died subsequently, which may, have, but but nobody died. Quite a lot of people were injured, but, but primarily it was property damage. And of course, it actually ironically led to the, probably the redevelopment of central Manchester rather than sooner than it might have happened. Um, uh, but but the a really important thing to remember when you're witnessing sort of major events like that happen on the news, on television, radio, or anywhere, is that you know. J journalists don't immediately understand what's going on any more than the rest of us do and they're trying to put together lots of bits of different information and form a picture and then convey that to an audience and you know I, the, the motto that i would kept in my head and didn't always keep to it is that at the end and this is absolutely enshrined in the bbc guidelines is that at, at the end of the day um, tr uh, accuracy is more important than speed and there's nothing worse than putting out a story that is wrong because you thought we've got to get it, we've got to get it, beat the opposition, we've got to get there first. Uh, and that was a day I remember when, you know, there were all sorts of things that were being reported and said and claimed, and we had to be very careful about what we um, what we did said on there. And the other one, there was uh, 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 2002, 2003, I think, the bizarre and awful accident, the Selby train crash, when the car came off the motorway and down onto the train track and the train hit it. Um, I seem to have a thing about trains because I was supposed to be on that train. I was supposed to be going to London that day for a BBC meeting and uh, li literally the evening before I got a call saying, oh, it's okay, Colin, the, the meeting's off. You don't need to come to London. So, um, but I was involved again as a sort of um, most senior editorial person at the BBC in Yorkshire at the time that happened. And again, it was a similar thing really, that it was a sort of, you know, never quite this, what we now all understand about what happened it wasn't, wasn't immediately clear. Uh, at the time um and there's again it's that thing of just standing back and saying hang on a minute what do we actually know or what do we just think and distinguishing between the two um, um to say a little bit about um sort of what happens behind the scenes um you know i, I think it's fair to say that the production values on news I'm thinking about television, the same is true of radio, I'm thinking about television particularly in this country are pretty high. If you see news programmes elsewhere in the world, in, in some countries, their production values and arguably their editorial values aren't as good as they are in Britain. And I'm not singing out the BBC, what I'm saying is also true of ITV News or of Sky News, with the two other main providers of news on television in this country. Um, uh, and we probably take a lot of it for granted really um it, however most of the time when something goes wrong on the news on television it's now quite unusual isn't it i mean it used to happen a lot more when i was first working the bbc all sorts of things go wrong. and um i can remember one particular day which i will never forget from my career when um when this was when i was a reporter based in manchester and um we used to, the way it used to work at the time is if you were a reporter you did a report a reporter piece for like the evening regional news program what often happened was you would edit this as we used to shoot on film in those days you shoot it on film you'd come back and the film would be processed and as it was being processed you'd write your script and then you'd do it and basically the film would be played when the program went out but you wouldn't have had time to record any commentary so you did your commentary sat in the studio sort of out of vision live as the thing was going on given cues of when to speak and which was fine most of the time, but sometimes, of course, you you record, you went and sh did stories, more featurey stories that weren't necessarily timed to a particular day because it wasn't like the news of the day. And I'd done this piece about um, some new project to restore the Anderton boat lift, which some of you may have heard of, which is well, a dramatic Victorian boat lift on the canal network in Cheshire. Anyway, and I was up in the Lake District, 
two or three days later doing a pretty different story. I was somewhere in Keswick. And I get a call at about three o'clock saying, uh, you know, the Anderson Boatlift story, Colin, we need to run it tonight. Something else has collapsed. We need to run it. Uh, it, is, it is finished, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's edited. Um, is there any commentary? No, 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 I haven't got commentary. Right, okay, well, can you get back in time for the, you know, to do it live? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I can try, but, you know, it's like two hours to drive from Keswick to Manchester on a good day. And um, what I didn't tell the newsroom was that not only was there no commentary recorded on it, I hadn't even written the commentary. So. I'm driving down the M6, sort of doing, I mean, fortunately, I think I must have edited it only a day or two before, so I could remember what the piece was. And I got somebody to send me the sort of durations I was trying to cover. And I'm sort of mentally writing this script as I'm driving down the motorway. And then I thought, I'm half an hour away from the middle of Manchester. The worst thing will be to arrive there and not have the contract. Stop for five minutes and actually write it down. So I stopped at a service station, wrote it down, you know, to get back going. And then on the sort of, this was a two-way radio. It wasn't a mobile phone thing we had in our cars. I'm driving through the Manchester rush hour and they're knocking the item down the running order to give me more time. I scream into the BBC car park. I run, which is breaking the first rule of broadcasting, never run to a studio. I've still got my coat on, go into the studio. The presenter's reading the link as slowly as he possibly can. <laughs> Colin Philpot reports. And I'm sat down, ready to do it get my cue to start reading. The 104-year-old Anderton boat lift. So the first 20 seconds of commentary was like breathless. And then there was a little bit where there was an interview clip so I could recover and then the rest of it was okay. But it was a bit of a nightmare. And thing, in, in, in some ways it was more fun. It was a bit less slick in those days, but uh, there, were, there were a lot more sort of mistakes like that, which um, you, you don't often see. But behind the scenes and all sorts of stuff goes on, which... Um, it would probably knock the sort of glamorous view people might have of TV production in general and news production um, in particular. Um, but I think the process of how news is put together, and this is true of newspapers as well, certain radio and television is a, is a really fascinating one, which I'd just like to say a little bit about. Um, I mean, when you watch, say, the BBC 10 o'clock news or the BBC 6 o'clock news, um, the process which has determined what stories appear on those news bulletins is a, you know, people have written books about this and, and you know, there's, there's one could talk about this for, for hours, but it, you know, so there's a few key points. I often would describe a newsroom as a factory of ideas. Now, I don't mean that that's a factory of things that have been made up, but in a sense, if you think about a news bulletin, there are probably a couple of items at the top and maybe one or two at the bottom, which pretty much have dictated themselves they're going to be on you know you know on the day Liz Truss resigns it's pretty certainly going to be top story and in fact probably fill pretty much the rest of the news there are some things it's obvious it's the most important thing of the day whether it's British story or some, somewhere else, else in the world and that's true whether you're talking about a national news program or, or a regional news program and there might be at the other end of of the news agenda there might be something that's so heartwarming or celebratory or whatever it is or something to do with sport which is also almost certainly to be on but the probably on many days 50 60 70 or even more percent of what's in the middle is chosen from a massive range of things that might be on and there are quite a few factors that play into that choice of course it's some sort of attempt to have an objective list of what are the most important things for the audience that you're providing this news for but you know that is quite a subjective thing anyway but it's certainly governed by things like um geography so for example if you're putting together the bbc national news at um uh, at 10 o'clock you want to make sure that all the stories aren't from london or indeed from you know you want to have some sort of geographical spread and uh, you know that's right and proper and even if you're producing a news program for uh, yorkshire you, you don't want to you want to make sure that the stories aren't all from leeds or you you want to spread it about because otherwise people will lose interest. That's one thing. Um, resources are quite important. You know, it's what I, it, a lot of what determines what goes on is how easy or difficult it is to get the story done in the time that's available. That's partly to do with where the story is, whether there are, you know, how easy it is to get people to talk about it, all those sorts of things. Um, there's certainly something about for television news about the pictorial quality of the story. Some stories are really interesting and important but they're very boring visually 
And then you'll notice that political correspondents often are illustrating their stories with yet another different angle shot of Big Ben or, you know, something at Westminster. Or people, you know, economics correspondents are trying to explain, you know, something to do with government borrowing. And you see sort of shots of people's legs going through the street or close ups of cash tills. And, you know, so there's a lot of what's called wallpaper, um, um, wallpaper pictures on, on television. The radio doesn't have that problem, of course. Um, which is why people often say the pictures are better off on the radio because you use your imagination to create the pictures. Um, so that we think quite properly, you know, you will to see a very definite and sometimes some might over engineered attempt to make sure that um, uh, uh, diverse things are properly diverse so that there are new stories about people from minority communities people with disabilities, people from different parts of the country, you know, all sorts of other ways in which you might classify people um, uh, to do with gender or sexuality, etc. cetera. Um, and, but I think another factor which um, uh, people might not be aware of is, which determines what things are included in a news programme or which aren't, is um, whose idea was it? I've sat in editorial meetings in BBC newsrooms where on day one, somebody suggests, why don't we do a story about so and so and so, and people go, nah, nah, we've done that before, I know, it's not interesting. Well, nah, nah, nah. Two days later, somebody else who's more senior or more respected in the newsroom comes and says, why don't we do a story about so that? exactly the same story? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah, yeah, we should do that. So there is a there is a sort of hierarchy of, as you get in any organisation, I suppose, and you know, where sometimes a story will get on because of who's proposed it or sponsored it, if you, if you like, within within the organization. So, you know, it's worth bearing in mind when you watch a news program that those sorts of factors have gone in to determine, um, determine what's, uh, what's on and what's been left out. Um, the things I remember particularly though, actually about my time um, as a news reporter particularly, and, and not so much the big stories, important that they are there, they're sort of more quirky things. And there are two that stick in my mind particularly um, the, the, the image on the left is, is a rather poor quality map of Cumbria uh, and that route you can see from Ulverston in the south to Carlisle in the north is the route of the Cumbria Way which is a you know a designated long fairly long distance footpath and which was created in the mid-1980s and um, I used to when I was a reporter I did do quite a lot of um, sort of countryside and outdoors type stuff and I was commissioned to do um, a series of uh, walking the Cumbria Way over five days, five nights. So it was five sort of items in the local news program. And uh, now I have in fact walked the entire Cumbria away and had done before I did it. But obviously when you go back to record it with a camera, you're not necessarily gonna drag a camera, the 75 or 80 or how many is miles length of Cumbria. So you go and film at the best bits, different bits to get different types of scenery. And I can remember getting, you know, a few, um, uh, um, letters and they weren't, again, they weren't emails in 1986. Um, in from people afterwards saying, mm, we're very suspicious about this Cumbria way. Colin Philpott's boots always look surprisingly clean. And uh, you have to explain to people, well, you know, yes, they probably were clean because, you know, I just walked down that track having got out of a car because we were recreating, but we were recreating something I had really done. So it was a, it was genuine in my view. It wasn't some sort of fake. Um, the other thing I remember about the Cumbria Way was that this thing was done as sort of five items that went into a news program, but then, you know, people quite liked it. So it was made into a documentary. And the documentary was bought in inverted commas by BBC Two and played on BBC Two nationally um, once or twice. And then for several years after that, in the days when the BBC had quite extensive cricket coverage, when it rained during a test match, they pull this thing out. And I quite often got phone calls from people saying, oh, I've just seen you on BBC Two. This was three or four years after we'd done it. And it was a sort of nice filler that would, would fill rain during test matches. If I'd been, had some deal where I could have had repeat fees for that thing, I think I'd have been quite a wealthy man. And the other one I particularly remember was also by coincidence in Cumbria. And this was in, I think it was 1986. And the late Duke, Duke of Edinburgh, who some of you may recall, was um, very much into carriage driving decided he was going to drive a horse and carriages across Morecambe Bay Sands. Morecambe Bay Sands, as you know, it can be treacherous and indeed dangerous because the tides come in 
so quickly, you know, so quickly. Uh, and there's a there's an official guide to the sands who you know will guide people across. So anyway, this was set up that the Duke of Edinburgh was going to do this thing, and uh, we've been giving it quite a lot of advanced publicity. I think it was during the May sort of uh, bank hol school holidays, the end of May, and it was a beautiful day, and thousands of people were there. The Lancashire Bank and the Cumbrian Bank and was rammed with people. Anyway, and we're, we're the Duke's there on his carriage with some horses, and you know we. Uh, blagged our way onto one of the other carriages and ITV were on another one and you know various other people and there were about a dozen I think sets of oh there we go across anyway we, we'd also hired a helicopter to film this thing from the air because you know beautiful pictures ITN had hired a helicopter the press association there were three helicopters above we're about to start it's about 11 o'clock in the morning and you know we're all there and the next thing we hear is expletives coming from the mouth of the Duke, the late Duke of Edinburgh who do you move those Helicopters are. I'm not starting with you. And his view was that the helicopters, which I'm sure were at the required um, legal height above, and you could hear them, you know, but it wasn't. Anyway, he, he decided that they were frightening the horses and he wasn't going to start until we moved the helicopters. Now, again, this was pre or just on the verge of mobile phones coming in. So I don't, I'm not sure I had a phone. So I'm not quite sure how we managed to communicate back to our newsroom, but it took about 15 minutes to get the helicopters to move up a bit. Then it all started. It was, you know, it was glorious. It was a fantastic picture sort of made for television. It had everything, the royal family, animals, the seaside, beautiful day. Uh, and it was a great occasion. Um, but the thing I remember is the <laughs> Duke of Edinburgh's expletives. Um, okay. Um, just a couple of other things that I thought it would be worth mentioning. My final job in the BBC, as I mentioned, was um, to be head of the BBC in, in this region from 1997 for about, uh, I think, seven, seven or eight years. Um, and so that meant I was responsible for all the regional television stuff, Look North and all of that, plus all the local radio stations in the area, plus, and this developed while I was doing the job, the creation of local websites by the BBC um, uh, during that period. Um, and when I took on the job, um, my biggest challenge was the fact that in almost every other region of the country, the BBC was the market leader. So if you're comparing the number of people watching the BBC regional news programme versus the ITV one, in every, pretty much every other region of the country, the BBC was ahead. But in Yorkshire, the opposite was true. Now, there were a number of reasons for that. But, you know, my mission when I pitched and applied for the job was, I'll turn this round. And obviously I had some ideas of how I was going to do it. Um, and there were a number of things to do with it, to do with the content of the programme and all of that. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the, we, it, the two things that it involved really were creating more localised service. So we were able to establish um, a separate programme, as you may know, the based in Hull uh, for the BC. So there are now two versions, the Look North version in Leeds, which broadly covers South, West and most of North Yorkshire. And then another version using a different transmitter, which covers East Yorkshire, Hull, you know, Humberside and, and Lincolnshire as well. Um, uh, but the other thing was presenters. My view was that we didn't have the best presenters. And when surveys were done about who, which presenters were most popular in this region, the person who always came top of this was Krista Ackroyd, who at the time, you may recall, was presenting the ITV programme calendar. So I decided I was going to try and get Krista to jump ship and come across the BBC. And I made contact her with her through you know, back channels, as they say. I, I, I sort of knew her before, but not really that well. Anyway, she agreed to meet me. And I said, okay, well, that's great. Well, where do you want to meet? She said, can we meet at the Trust House Forte at Brig House, just off the M60? I said, fine, yeah, fine. So I hired a room. I, I hastened to add a meeting room, not a bedroom, a room, meeting room at the Trust House Forte. I don't think it's called that now, but it, it's the one you can see as you come past Brig House on the motorway. Anyway, at the appointed hour, whatever, so I'd got this room, I got, I think I've got a bottle of wine and whatever. And the appointed hour came and went and she hadn't arrived. And I thought, nah, she's bottled out, she didn't want to do it. 15 minutes more, you know, still no sign of Krista. And I was about to give up on Ringer and say, look, okay, fine. And then I see coming down the corridor towards this room, um, Krista walking towards me, one of the most recognisable faces in New Yorkshire, wearing a ridiculous pair of dark sunglasses as she was trying to disguise herself. Anyway, we had the meeting and, um, we subsequently had other meetings. We've got a bit more brush about it. We've, I can remember meeting several times at, in the bar at the Cedar Court Hotel in Bradford. 
And sometimes she'd get a bit nervous. Oh, I'm not sure this is a good idea meeting. I said, look, Kristen, nobody, everybody knows who you are, but nobody knows who I am. So, you know, they'll just think, you know, we're having an affair or something. You know, don't worry about it. And um, anyway, the, the, lo the, lo the long and short of it was she did in great secrecy. We sort of signed a contract with her and, you know, and then she told ITV she was leaving and it was all announced and she joined us. And it, it made an enormous difference. We'd previously, I previously persuaded Harry Gratian, who very sadly, as you know, died earlier this year, who'd, who'd previously presented Lord North, but had wandered off down south to work down, down south for the BBC. We'd persuaded him to come back. So Harry had come back about a year before, I think. Uh, and the audience figures had improved when Harry came back. And when Krista came, it almost flipped like that. Um, and then when we did the more local versions, it completely went like that. Um, and, uh, and it's still true now, um, 20 years later, the best part of 20 years later, that the BBC has a significantly higher audience than uh, ITV for, for regional news. So, you know, um, it was an interesting process um, doing it. Um, but I was quite, did feel quite proud. And when the day after we announced Krista, the Yorkshire Post described it as one of the greatest coups in broadcasting history, which I think was a bit hyperbole, but um, at a local level, regional level, I, I suppose maybe, maybe it was. I'm just looking how we're doing for time. Um, I, I'll probably just, Skim Fine, over it. Carry on, carry on. Uh, okay. Um, just very briefly, uh, just a few sort of key questions about the BBC now. Um, is the BBC biased? I think this is an important question, which is often raised. And the reason there's a picture of John Prescott there, and I won't tell the whole story now because we're, we're a bit short on time, is that I once had a bizarre experience when John Prescott, obviously a Hull MP, um, but at the time Deputy Prime Minister, uh, I remember him ringing, I got something called Deputy Prime Minister on the line. I did know John Prescott before this happened and the, oh, hello, Colin. I won't attempt to do the accent. And basically he was trying to persuade me to schedule something to fit in with when he was going to announce something, um, you know, and I had to say, look, Deputy Prime Minister, it's very nice of you to give me a call, but I think you should decide what you're gonna do when you're gonna do it and we'll decide what we do and blah, blah, blah. So the point being that, you know, when you were in a vaguely senior editorial role in the BBC, you were being subjected to pressure from politicians all the time. And I'm sure that, you know, from all sides, are trying to influence the news agenda, sometimes in a subtle way, often in a not subtle way at all. Um, uh, and I'm sure that, I know that absolutely still goes on today. Um, it, but um, it's obviously really important to understand that the, the issue about the political um, impartiality of the BBC, obviously the BBC is required by its charter, as indeed is ITN News and Sky News by their um, it's not a charter, but their equivalents, um, to be politically impartial. Um, and um, and that, in terms of the BBC, it's important to understand that's not always been the case, that it, the BBC's editorial independence from the government of the day was really only firmly established about 30 or 40 years after the BBC had been set up. I mean, at the general strike in 1926, the government took the view and the BBC acquiesced in it that the government, you know, the BBC was a spokesperson almost for the government line. In the Second World War, it's an interesting and complicated story, but, you know, the BBC wasn't truly sort of independent. Um, and it was the Suez crisis that really brought it to a head where the BBC did stand up to the government and say, we're not taking just the government's line, the government of the day's line. And since then, the BBC got more confident about it. And now it's absolutely the case that the BBC's view is that it is in no way beholden to the government of the day or indeed to the opposition today, and is trying to be independent. And, you know, we can all find examples, depending on our own political viewpoint of where we think, oh, the BBC is full of lefties, or the BBC is right wing, uh, and I'm not saying the BBC always gets it right, but one thing I certainly found in my experience, as I say, when I was a sort of senior editor level, was one day I'd pick up the phone to somebody from the Labour Party in Yorkshire, for example, saying, Colin, look north last night was outrageous. The story you did about so-and-so, absolute Tory bias, Tory propaganda, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to write to my aunt, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. The next day, you know, a Conservative regional office, you're full of left, you're all left wing, you're all... Blah, blah, blah. And it may sound slightly trite, but I think it is fair to say that, you know, if you balance up those complaints from left and right, they come to about the same volume. Now, people have done more scientific studies of that. And it's difficult, of course. It's not, a, it's not just a question of how many stories. or it's, it's complicated to work out the editorial line or something. But all I can tell you is that my view was that we got complaints from all sides. And in my experience at the BBC, 
the one's own political views, you left them at the door. And people didn't really discuss their political views. It was, a, you know, it was a bit of a taboo subject in BBC newsrooms. And you know, I, don't, I, I hope and imagine it still is. I like, guess yeah, sometimes you know you knew what people's political views were, but I honestly think the vast majority of BBC journalists make an honest attempt to not allow their own personal views to colour the way they um, look at things. Um, another question that's often asked about the BBC is: Is it value for money? Well, again, probably depends on your standpoint and what you're interested in, but that's just a bit of an attempt that I stole from somewhere recently of uh, sort of what the BBC provides. And I'm, actually, I'm sure it's not comprehensive, but you know, four TV channels, well, no more than that, seven or eight TV channels being created, like things like BBC Parliament, um, depending how you count it, six or seven national radio stations, 39 local radio stations, you know, national radio stations for Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, the whole online offering, iPlayer, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. For what is it? One hundred and fifty-nine pounds a year, three pounds a week, roughly. Um, if you start comparing that with Sky subscriptions and other sort of comparable media offerings, you know, my personal view is that it comes out as pretty good value for money, even if you don't use a lot, even if you only use three or four of those things. Um, but again, it's a matter of a subjective thing. But I think sometimes people don't quite appreciate how much the BBC provides. Um, and I suppose the thing that I always think about, again, I'm about to, this is my own personal opinion, it's not the BBC's, probably the BBC wouldn't agree with what I'm about to say actually, but um, my personal opinion is if you really boil it down, there are a couple of things that I think are pretty much unique to the BBC and there are a couple of things that really matter. The first is the thing I talked about a couple of moments ago, which is the BBC's news, and I don't just mean news, but news, current affairs, factual operation, is in my view, an honest attempt at independent, impartial, trusted news. With the caveat that it doesn't always get it right, which I've already said, but you know, when you think about what the BBC, and you know, I accept that ITV news, although you might say it's a bit more tabloid, is sort of trying to do the same thing as well. The, the idea that you have news on television which is trying to be impartial and objective is a really important thing. When you look at the media landscape, the news media landscape in America, for example, and in some other countries that I would regard as, you know, that are liberal democracies where you've got parties and news channels. So I think in the Netherlands, for example, you've got news channels, which sort of a bit like the newspapers here. Everybody knows the Daily Mail is a right wing newspaper. Everybody knows the Guardian is a left wing newspaper. And that's fine in a way. But I think that actually having broadcast media where there's an attempt to be objective rather than banging a drum for the right or banging a drum for the left is actually something we should hang on to. Because if you see the Fox News model in America or GB News we now have in this country, I don't know whether you've watched that, it's worth watching. Um, but I personally think it's more about opinion than news. Um, so I think that to me, that's the first thing that's you, you know, really important about the BBC. And in an increasingly fractured and divided society, I think it's even more important than it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And the second thing is that the BBC does provide stuff that the market never would, or is very unlikely to. And the BBC provides stuff that is important for minority interests. I don't just mean, I'm not talking about ethnic minority interests, although that would include that. Um, things that are never properly going to be attractive to commercial broadcasters actually local programming, local radio, which is in the news at the moment because the BBC is proposing some cuts to local radio, as you may have seen. Um, those things um, uh, and many others, particularly programmes that support the arts and cultural world, are really important. And I think if you didn't have the BBC or something like it, uh, many of those things would probably fall by the wayside. Um, and the other thing to say is even if you, and this is, I will stop after this and then take some questions. If you do believe that the BBC is worth keeping, um, you do have to then answer the question, well, how should it be funded? And I, I don't think that that's no, I think if you believe in the BBC, it doesn't necessarily mean you also believe in the license fee. I think there are lots of reasons why the license fee is perhaps an unfair tax and it feels very outdated. It's quite difficult to enforce in a way now 
in a, in a world which it delivers stuff in the old days of you know you could you could only get it on television and radio and you knew who had a television by and large um however and i'm not going to go through all of these there are several other ways you could consider funding the bbc but they all have problems <laughs> um funding from general taxation you know undoubtedly would make the bbc more susceptible to pressure from the government um a broadband levy well you know which, which government's ever going to agree to charge people more for their broadband in order to fund something like the bbc and then advertising or subscription models ha have their problems so um I, i'm going to pause at that point um and just say i hope that's given you a bit of a flavor of my own um, experience in the bbc for what it's worth and more importantly has given you a bit of a understanding of you know some of the processes and how bbc makes decisions and also a view and it is just my view uh, about why the bbc i still think despite its mistakes and flaws um is something we should hang on to and would miss if it disappeared thank you thank you colin um if people would like to ask a question could you um add them to the chat and I've got one from Nada to start with, actually, um, which is um, how how did the BBC react to the spoof W1A from about ten years ago? Well, I mean, I don't sure I know the exact answer to that question, but I mean, I think it's what it is an illustration of is something which the BBC the BBC is very good at taking the Mickey out of itself. And that's not the first example, is it, of a program where no. you know the BBC is taking making up itself. And also, I particularly I talked about Greg Dyke earlier that if you remember when all that was going on, um, two thousand four, I think that was, wasn't it? So oh, eighteen years ago, scary, scary. Um, and if you remember, there was a, there was a great and genuine outpouring of sympathy from within the BBC, BBC staff. For Greg Dyke and the fact that he was basically being forced out because of what happened over Hutton and whatever the BBC mistakes the BBC may have made about Hutton, you know, undoubtedly the whole thing got caught up in the political fight about the Iraq War and you know I, to a certain extent I think the, Greg Dyke was a victim of all of that, but there was a great outpouring of support for Greg because he'd been a very popular Director General. I mean, I knew. I'm, knew him quite well because he spent a lot of time in this part of the country, partly because one of his daughters was at Leeds University, but more importantly, because we had a lot of developments in the North, he was very much a supporter of moving a lot of BBC activity to the North of England. And the whole thing of moving a lot of BBC operation to Salford was started. Most of it didn't happen until after Greg had left, but he started that whole process. So I saw quite a lot of him, got to know him quite well. Mm. I also knew his predecessor, John Burt, quite well. Um, and you couldn't be more chalk and cheese. You know, John Burt was not a people. John Burt didn't know how to manage people. Um, and Greg Dyke absolutely did. It was very popular. But the point about it in the context of the question, sorry, is that, you know, the BBC has, I don't, I, you know, you, I, you can't imagine in some other countries or even indeed other media outlets in this country reporting on their controversies about themselves. You know, when the BBC reports about the BBC being criticised for doing something, the Jimmy, all the Jimmy Savile stuff, and the various other you know scandals which have hit the BBC, you will find objective reporting about that about the BBC on the BBC, and that I think is a great credit to the organisation. Mm, yeah. yeah, I think W one A is brilliant. By the way, <laughs> that was brilliant. And, you know, <laughs> I recognise a lot of the things it was described. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? I haven't seen anything else on chat. Um, just. I'll just have a look around if anyone's got a hand up with a question. See any hand up? I'm trying to remember, I had thought of a question halfway through. I'm now trying to remember it. Um, I think I would like to ask actually what you yeah. think about the local radio, because um, it seems mm. a bit of a hotchpotch, the recent suggestions. You know that they'll switch yeah. to national in the afternoon or something i mean some of you might remember if you do listen to local radio that when local radio started back in the well, late 60s and 70s actually it was a bit of a mishmash like that then because when it started it wasn't sort of broadcasting all day and they i think used to default to radio four or radio two or something um in the afternoons at various times and there have been shared programs between local radio stations at certain times of the day in the past and even now so it's yeah. not a completely new idea um and you know i i 
one of the vows I made when I left the BBC is not to sort of slag off the generations of management who followed me because I know what, how difficult it is to make the decisions when somebody says you've got to save you know x million pounds out of a budget. Um, I, I think uh, one of the brilliant well, I mean this is a bit political but one of the brilliant examples of local radio was when Liz Truss went on yeah, local radio. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, After the no, I mean, I, I'm an enormous fan of local radio, you know, not just as somebody yeah. who's worked on it for years, but I mean, I'd still listen to you know, my local station, station probably for most yeah. of you, Radio York. Um, and I think it has a tremendously important role to play in a democracy. And it has a great um, sort of community importance of, you know, celebrating community and all of that. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's a shame that, that they're proposing what is being proposed, because it will be a diminution of the locality or the localness of the service. There may mm -hmm. still be something called BBC Radio York, but you're not getting as much genuinely North Yorkshire content throughout the day as you do at the moment. Um, and it will be great if it's a shame and if the BBC could find a way of saving it. I think one other aspect, well, two other things about it are, the announcement does include a commitment to put more into the BBC's local news services. And I think that's a good thing because if you go on the BBC local news website, sometimes they feel a bit out of date. They're not mm. up to date. And mm. that's partly because the BBC backed off a bit a few years ago, because it was getting a lot of criticism that it was sort of, you know, doing local newspapers and local news sites out of business, you know, and the BBC backed off and they slightly changed the nature of their local sites. But I think the trouble is you go on them and something, well, I know all that, and oh, that was yesterday's news or last week's news. Yeah. So I think if they're genuine about improving those, that's good. And obviously that costs money to do it properly. Um, but to do that, as it were, at the expense of, local radio I think is a great shame and I mean there's a little cynical bit of me that says I wonder if the BBC is flying a kite here and sort of knowing there'll be an outrage and knowing MPs will jump up and down about it as they already have done in a thing in the commons earlier in the week and then they can, they'll back off I don't know I might be being a bit cynical um, there'll be a bit of compromise and it won't be quite as dramatic as it sounds but it's a shame I happen to know that um, that there were literally people in tears in the newsroom at BBC Radio York when this was announced mm. uh, yeah, uh, yeah so, you know a lot of people work there for years they're absolutely dedicated they're really experienced good people and okay some of them might transfer to new jobs but not all of them some of them won't have the skills or won't have the motivation um so that's a shame at a personal level but i think you know i think it's the you know the commercial radio sector isn't really interested in news yes they they masquerade to do a certain amount of local news but it's not the same as what BBC does. And it's not just about news. It's also about, as I said earlier, it's about celebrating the community and bringing the community together and all of that, which I think, you know, BBC Local Radio has done brilliantly for the last uh, 50 years or more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've got a question from Adrian. What advice, yep. would you, what advice would you give a young person contemplating <laughs> joining the BBC today? Um, well, I mean, in some ways, I would say it's fantastic. Whoops. Sorry, Colin, you've frozen. I'll keep Sorry, talking. Sorry, could you oh. say that again? Because I think you froze. Okay, can you hear me now? You're hearing yeah. me now, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I think in some ways it's a more exciting time to be thinking about working for the BBC or indeed other media organisations than it was when I started, you know, 40 or something years ago. Um, because there's so much more output, you know, there's not just television and radio, there's all the online offering as well. Um, and also people coming into the news industry now are coming in, in many cases, as sort of multimedia people. So when you know, it was very departmentalised when I did it, compartmentalised, I should say, you know, reporters reported camera men, and they were mainly men, shot and editors edited and et cetera, et cetera. It's now much more uh, multi-skilled. And, you know, I, I've done a bit of sort of work, nothing to do with the BBC recently with uh, someone who, you know, can shoot the material, edit it and all of that. And, that, you know, that, 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 I think that's exciting. Um, mm. On the other hand, um, the demands are greater. Um, there's a lot more, because there's a lot more output, it must, it's more demanding, I would say. Um, uh, the, the thing is even more um, open to scrutiny than it was. Um, so you make a mistake, it's more likely to get, you know, slagged off on social media or whatever, than, which didn't exist yeah. when I started. Um, uh, but, but uh, and, and you know, some people say, oh, don't go in the media. I think, you know, the local newspaper industry, for example, is in many ways on its last. 
Sorry, you're frozen again. Hello, Colin. I think you've That's frozen nice. again. Okay, I can hear you and I can yeah, see you. Yeah, yeah, you're you. back, you're back. It just freezes right, again. Sorry. I'm not sure if it's Brief. me clicking on chat or what's happening. Um, briefly, uh, briefly, I would still say yes, it's, a, it's an exciting, interesting and worthwhile thing to do you know the, the business of news is not just it's certainly not it can be entertaining from time to time it's not about entertainment it's about providing important information about what's going on and holding people to account so it's a worthwhile thing to be thinking of doing as a career yeah and another um question is how has the 24-hour online bbc news website affected the main tv news are the news teams combined or separate um it's a bit of a complicated answer to that. They're separate in the sense that you will have a dedicated team of people actually writing and putting together the, the web pages. But as you will see, people who you will see on the television, I mean, for example, Chris Mason, the BBC's political editor, will appear on the Today programme. He'll appear on the BBC main television news. But you will see his blogs and his opinion pieces on the BBC website as well. So you know, people, particularly people who are sort of senior editors and correspondents like Chris and the economics editor and people like that will be expected to produce material for the website and indeed for podcasts. And you may have seen things like newscast and those sorts of things. Um, so the new media ways of doing things, well, mm -hmm. they'll certainly be expected to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And the production teams for those things, the actual production of them may be different, but you know, they, they are working together. And you know, when I was in the BBC, there was a whole big thing about getting radio and television to work together. And that seemed complicated enough in those days. But now it's radio and television and social media and various other things. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think it's important that the BBC puts its material across all its platforms or all platforms that are relevant. Uh, and, and that's certainly how it, you know, that's, the, that's its starting point, really. I've remembered my question, actually. It's when yeah. you talked about wallpapering. <laughs> and one of my bet noirs is actually um, usually the 10 o'clock news, um, where they stand outside 10 Downing Street in the pouring rain, oh. telling you things that actually there's no prime minister. He's probably gone off to checkers for the weekend anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, so rather than the feet walking around, it's that sort of, and I always think, why are they standing in the rain? Yes, or when, um, you know, during the, particularly during the pandemic and, where you know Hugh Pym, the BBC health editor, would go and stand outside a hospital just to say something that yeah. you know he could have yeah. said. Yeah, I think it's a fair point. Um, I suppose maybe maybe this is all maybe this is, I don't know. Yeah, if you see somebody outside Downing Street and he's got the the moniker political editor, he or she have got the moniker political editor. You know, you maybe it's maybe part of building up a sense that he's close to the action. He knows what he or she is talking yeah. about. Um, yeah. So maybe it's a maybe it's a sort of perception thing rather than anything of substance. And um, yeah, but yeah some, sometimes you think you know there was one occasion during I thought maybe it was was it it wasn't during the royal death at some time in the recent political shenanigans when it absolutely poured with rain. Was it just yes. before Boris Johnson? And Hugh Edwards, the people were outside, you know, they were very teeming down, you know, to the point you could hardly hear what people were saying. You thought, why, 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 you know? Um, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the great thing about the, the 10 Downing Street is that, you know, sometimes if you're bored with the politics, you can see Larry the Cat appearing and, you know, giving his commentary on the, um, on the, on the, the, the news. Yeah, there's, right there was a very nice uh, little video on social media of Larry the Cat um, chasing a fox away, mm. um, yeah, yeah. you know, in some point in October. I mean, one of the things that if you, in fact, there's been a trail on the BBC recently about, you know, to do with the BBC's messages that it's been putting out about its own centenary. And one of them is about, you know, we're a trusted news provider. You might have seen it. And the snatches of the snatches of recent sort of new big news stories with BBC reporters, you know, being mm. filmed, being filmed and, and, and quotes from those editorial guidelines that I mentioned earlier. And one of them, you know, which is an important principle is, you know, in principle, we should try and report the news firsthand. You know, whether it's a war in Ukraine or political yeah. events in Westminster or a train crash in wherever. So, you know, there is a thing even in this day of sort of easy communication, you know, you, you, the idea of the reporter being at the scene, I think is still a valid point to be an eyewitness. Yeah. Now, sometimes I know I've done it myself. You go to the scene and you feel you know less about it than people back in the newsroom who've got access to lots of information coming in. But even so, I think having reporters and at the scene reporting it firsthand you know, it depends what it is, of course, but is is still a, a good principle to start from, you know.
yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Gail has made a nice point, which is news may be aimed to be politically and socially impartial, but you wouldn't want comedy, drama and general programming to be in a straitjacket. No, absolutely. No, absolutely. And, and, and also, you know, in relation to news, it, it, it's trying to be impartial, but it doesn't mean that, you know, it's in some ways the, the more difficult issue actually about news and current affairs is not so much the political impartiality, important though that is, you know, it's, and climate change is a really good example. You know, mm -hmm. you could argue that, um, or, or you know, the the um, the whole um, series of stories around um, gender, particularly in relation to, you know, um, the Me Too uh, movement and um, all of that. You, you you know, you could look at some BBC coverage and say the BBC, in a sense, is taking a view simply by covering so much of this. Um, and, you know, and it's a very difficult judgment. Climate change is a real example. I think, you know, the BBC's answer would be this, that, and I agree with this, that, you know, the overwhelming scientific evidence is that climate change is, A, it's important, serious, existential in its importance, and that it is fundamentally caused by human activity. And not everybody agrees with that, but the overwhelming majority of people, I think, probably accept that. And therefore, you know, doing a lot of coverage about climate change, which sort of reinforces that view, is fine. Now, when you've got other things where there are clearly big differences of opinion about something, and I suppose an example of this might be, not necessarily in Britain, but abortion or, you know, issues where there's clearly not a 50-50, but, you know, there's a, there's a legit, reasonable people might legitimately hold different views, you know. Um, Brexit would be an example of that, I suppose. Um, then I think it is the duty of the BBC to be balanced in a certain way. Um, but um, but it, I, I think it's, you know, often the, the, in, the impartiality of news issue is not so much about what's covered, how a particular story is covered, but it's about what stories are covered in the first place. What mm -hmm. things you, you throw a light on, you know, so you shine a light on and what things you yeah. don't shine a light on. But, I, you know, the, going to the wider point about programming, yes, the BBC is impartial and sometimes impartial is implied as being, well, a bit boring or a bit bland. You know, the, the, the BBC is, you know, I think Lord Reith got it right. He, he got a lot of things wrong, actually. But Lord Reith got it right in the inform, what was the correct order? Inform, educate and entertain. You know, I think even in news, it needs to be entertaining in the sense it needs to be done in an interesting way, not in a trivial way, or, but in an interesting way. Otherwise, people won't bother with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't seem to have any more questions. And um, so I think this is a point to say thank you very much, Colin. What, by the way, one thing I've mentioned, this is not a plug for any, this is not a book of mine, but I thought uh, this is a really good book. Quite a few books have been written about the BBC this year for obvious reasons. Yeah. yeah, some, yeah. Of which, some of which were, as it were, commissioned by the BBC. There is a sort of official history of the BBC, which is fine. This is a, this is a book which um, I came across because I, I did some interviewing, um, as I do each year at the Ilkley Literature Festival. And I interviewed, met the author and interviewed him. Uh, it's written by Simon Potter, who's an academic at Bristol, and it's called This is the BBC. And it's a very good account. It's not too long. It's about just under 300 pages of the, of the history of the BBC. And it's very sort of straightforward, but it's, mm. it's completely impartial. It's not written, you know, by the BBC for the BBC. It's about yeah. the BBC. And it particularly goes through what I alluded to, which is the, you know, how the BBC's editorial independence has developed over the years. But it also looks at lots of other issues to do with abuse, including some of the, you know, the bad stuff about Jimmy Savile and all of that. But also just it's a, quite a good reminder of all the different types of programmes the BBC's made on television and radio, you know, as decade as the decades have gone by. So I, it's a really, I recommend it. Simon yeah. Potter, this is the BBC. I'll put a note in our newsletter mm. about it. Yeah. But I'll note that down in a moment. Um, and thank you very much. It's very enjoyable and fascinating to to feel that we had a little bit of inside the BBC this evening. So thank you very much, Colin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation.